Hi and welcome to the fifth and final instalment of the How Drugs Work sessions and this is looking at stereochemistry. Stereochemistry is obviously very important when we're looking at drug molecules because the drug targets are stereospecific. Enzyme receptors are st stereospecific. They're very sensitive to the arrangement in space of the groups and atoms in the molecule. I'm going to start by looking at adrenaline. I'm going to look at the optical isomerism. And we can see then, when we look at optical isomerism, we're looking at chiral carbons. And hopefully you can see that this adrenaline has got one chiral carbon, and that is here. A chiral carbon obviously means that we've got four different groups attached to that carbon. Now, it would appear there that there is only three, and that's because we've got a hydrogen, which when we draw the skeletal formulas, we do not show. So we've got a hydrogen there as well. So let's just show that we've got four different groups attached. The OH, the hydrogen, this group here, and this group here. They're my four different groups. Now, because it's got a chiral carbon, that means that adrenaline would have a non-superimposable mirror image. And we call these um, two non-superimposable mirror images enantiomers. And... It's important that when we're looking at synthesizing certain drugs, maybe based on adrenaline, for example, salbutamol, that it is important to realise that the stereochemistry is important. Salbutamol is far more active in, for example, the R configuration compared to the uh, S configuration. So what do I mean by the R and S configuration? It basically tells us the spatial arrangement of atoms in the molecule. And it's based on something called the Kahn Ingold prelog rules. So we're going to use these Kahn Ingold prelog rules to assign um, a priority, uh, assign um, whether this adrenaline molecule is R or S. And the first thing we do then is obviously we look at the um, priority of the atoms bonded to the chiral carbon. And the priority is based on atomic number. So we look at the atomic number of all the atoms bonded to this chiral carbon. We've got an 8 here uh, for oxygen. We've got a 6 for this carbon, a 6 for this carbon, and 1 for the hydrogen. So instantly, we can assign that as number 1, because oxygen's got a higher atomic, the highest atomic number. We've got a tie, because we've got a 6, and we've got a 6. So we move on to the next atom along. Well, the next atom along from this carbon... Is an N that's got an atomic number of seven. This carbon's next atom along is another carbon, or this if you're going this way, another carbon, and that's a six. Seven is bigger than six, so this group is priority two. Also, you've got now a six and a one. Six is bigger than one, so this is group three. This is group four. So I've assigned priorities to all the groups bonded to the chiral carbon. It's very, very important then, when we start assigning it, we have to put the lowest priority group, in this case the hydrogen, behind the plane, and which is the, the, wet, the, the dashed bond. Now, when we do that then, so we've got it now, the hydrogen already is the, the dashed bond, we assign priorities, we then make a little arc from one through to three. And we can see that if we do that, we go from one through to three, we go in a clockwise direction. So we're going from one to two to three. There we're going clockwise, and the clockwise direction is the R enantiomer. So this is R adrenaline. Okay, so that's Again, how you'd use canning or prelog rules to assign R or S. Now, another type of stereoisomerism is something called EZ. And here we've got clavulanic acid, which is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Um, so what, what that does, it's obviously some antibacterial resistance can occur because the enzyme, uh, the bacteria have developed an enzyme called beta-lactamase, which hydrolyzes the penicillin and stops penicillin working. So what we can do is we've de de um, devised um, a, a potential solution to this, and we've made this beta uh, this um, clavulinic acid. This inhibits beta lactamases, and therefore um, allows the penicillin to work. Um, so 
this clavulinic acid here is normally given with um, a beta lactam antibiotic. And again, you've got a specific um, arrangement in space of the atoms due to the restricted rotation around this double bond. So that means that these groups here are fixed in space. Now, again, we can use this thing called these Canning or prelog rules, and this time we can assign this either a E or Z priority. So what we do then is we look at each carbon in the carbon carbon double bond. Let's just give them a, a, a green and a blue colour. So I look at carbon which has been highlighted in green, and I say, right, which is my high priority and my low priority? So I'm all going for high or low. I don't need to number one to four, it's just simply high or low. Now Again, this is based on atomic number. So we've got an oxygen, which is eight, and a carbon, which is six. So eight comes before six. So we say then this is the high, and this is my low. We do the same thing for the other carbon, the blue carbon. Again, this is out is number six. And again, if we see nothing there, then we just assume it's a hydrogen. So we've got six <clears throat> and one. So again, this is going to be high. This is going to be low. And we can see now, if I draw an imaginary line here, we can see that both the high priority groups at the same side, that is, they're both above the calm calm double bond, the two low groups, are both the same side, they're both below this imaginary yellow line. And if both groups are on the same side of the double bond, we give it the Z, um, the Z notation. So this is Z clavu uh, lanic acid. And we normally put a bracket around that. Okay. Um, so obviously, if we were to swap these two around, that would be then the E clavulanic acid. So it's E Z isomerism. The last type of isomerism is something called conformational isomerism. We're going to have a look at um, this is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a very very flexible molecule because these single bonds can rotate. So what we've got then is lots and lots of rotatable bonds. What that means then is that these bonds can rotate. And because these bonds can rotate, it means that they've got lots and lots of different shapes. And this is the reason why acetylcholine tends to switch on all cholinergic receptors, because it can adapt, ad adopt, sorry, so many different shapes by the fact it's got lots of these rotatable bonds. And the more, li the, the more likely shape that they're going to uh, adopt, or you would, you would imagine, is one where it's got the most stable arrangement in space. And you can have different arrangements. This would be an example. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look along bond four and five. So we're going to basically have a look at these two carbons. So the carbon five, I'll just do this as a straight line. So what we've got here is this here is in effect carbon five. And we can say then that a bond to carbon five, we've got this N Me3. So we can see bond to carbon five is this N Me3. And we've also got two hydrogens. And we're going to assume that behind this now, directly behind this, is another carbon, which is carbon number uh, four. And attached to carbon four, then, is two hydrogens and this O, O, C, H, three. So what we've got there is we've got a two hydrogens. Oops, I'll just make that straight, sorry. So two hydrogens and this O and we're going to call it an AC. This group here is often called an acetyl group AC. So let's just let's just explain what we've got here. We're looking along bonds uh, four and five. This here we can imagine is carbon five. So it's got two hydrogens which are here, and this N 
ME3, which is here. Directly behind this is carbon-4. Carbon-4 has got these two hydrogens, which are this and this, and this O, OCH3, which is this. Now, what you can see here is that these bulky groups that we can highlight here and here are as far apart as possible. And that gives it a very stable arrangement because basically they're not bumping into each other in space. Okay, we call this an eclipsed, uh, sorry, staggered confirmation as opposed to an eclipse confirmation where these would be directly behind each other, which, is, which would be very unstable. However, it, it is possible that the molecule could also adapt a slightly different arrangement in space. So let's just copy this. So instead of them being arranged like this, what we could do potentially is have the OAC here. Now this is slightly less stable because now these big bulky groups are interfering with each other in space a little bit. And we call this a gauche. This here is called a gauche interaction. It's still a, what we call a staggered confirmation, um, but it's this arrangement here is slightly less stable than this one. However, this arrangement in space could still uh, be what we call an active confirmation for a certain receptor because uh, the stabilisation energy gained from the binding interactions would compensate for this lack, uh, this, this slightly less energetically stable confirmation. Now, one thing that we do when we're designing drugs, we want, um, for example, a certain drug molecule to adapt a very specific arrangement in space. And that would mean that it's got um, more specificity to a certain receptor, which is why these arrangements in space here are very, very important. Acylcholine can, can adopt lots of arrangements in space. This is, these are just two examples of the different arrangements in space the atoms could adopt. This arrangement in space may bind to one receptor. This arrangement in space might bind to another receptor. So what we want to do when we're designing drugs, potentially, is fix these atoms in a certain arrangement in space. That will lead to less uh, unfavourable interactions and therefore less side effects with my drugs. So an example would be something like muscarine, and I'm going to draw muscarine's structure here. This is just an example of another compound which could switch on a, a cholinergic receptor. So what we've got here is we've got muscarine. So what we've got here is, let's just move this down a little bit. So what we've got there is muscarine and we can see that in the Acetylcholine, we've got an NCC, OCC, and here we've got an NCC, OCC. So it's the same uh, acetylcholine skeleton, but these groups now are fixed in space, and they don't have this flexibility to move around like the acetylcholine molecule. What that means then, it's much more likely to interact with certain specific receptors rather than others. So, for example, muscarine um, binds to muscarinic receptors. It will not tend to bind to nicotinic receptors because the arrangement in space of these groups are fixed. Whereas acetylcholine, because it can, it's got these rotatable bonds, these arrangement spaces can vary that could tend to bind to nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. So here you can see uh, within this little session how important the arrangement in space of the groups are. We've got this conformational uh, arrangements, the arrangement in space due to rotation of bonds. We've got the arrangement in space due to double bonds, which again, we often design drug molecules with double bonds to fix atoms in a certain arrangement in space. And we've also looked at the importance of um, optical isomerism. Again, um, drugs tend to be very sensitive, sorry, 
targets tend to be very sensitive um, to what type of optical isomer you've got. So that there concludes um, all the sessions then on how drugs work.